Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the news behind the news with Ralph Cantava on Mix 94.7 FM. And I hope you're having a good day, and thank you for joining me on today's program. This afternoon, we're going to delve into the world of entertainment uh, here locally and abroad as well. And uh, on the program to basically enlighten us on all of that is none other than Mr. Chantry, the cut creator, DJ Outcast, Hodge. Wow, that's a hell of an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, no, um, I'm glad to have you on the program, you know, because, uh, you know, I always try to, well, not try, <laughs> but I, I love having a range of persons, you know, from different backgrounds and industries on the program, um, because I think one, the main thing for me is to highlight and showcase um, the brilliance that we have here on St. Martin. Thank and you. I know, appreciate the invite. Yeah. And, and, and we have people, you know, who can and, uh, educate us, inform us about different stuff. And, you know, with you being a DJ, you know, it's it's something that's, that's not a hobby. This is a profession. Absolutely. This is something you've built your career on. Yep. And I think exploring that is, is you know, is, is also to a benefit of um, our youth in particular. So... To start off, you know, I think my first question for you would be, what's one music genre that you secretly love? <laughs> it, it, it's like being in the business, you get to learn to like everything and get a love for, for everything in and out. But if you have to really ask me, like, what do I listen to in my car driving, going to and from work, to and from home? It'd be a mixture of hip hop, a little bit of R&B. But if I have to be completely honest, it's straight up reggae music. Yeah, straight up reggae music. Like I'm not even talking like dance hall or anything out like that. I'm talking like reggae music. Okay, I, li I listen to a lot of reggae music, and I actually listen to a lot of like sound clash too. I li I'm a big fan of uh, the sound clash culture. So that's what I basically. Listen what about to that? Um, as media fan of it, the, the, just the um, uh, the competitiveness of it, and I'm a big fan of the dub plate culture. You know, the dub plates where um, you you get in touch with an artist and you have them re-record their song, but like with um, like rewritten lyrics and you I, I, and mm. it, mentioning the person's name. Like for instance, you would get like a Beanie Man to re sing over his song, but mentioning DJ Outkast in it. I I love that dub plate culture. How they rewrite the songs, rearrange the songs, put it on different type of beats and all that. I love that part of the culture. That's why I listen to a lot of song clash. Just it, you know, because it's, it's something I enjoy. I really I really like that side of it. Okay. All right, so I'm going to uh, start from the beginning. Sure. Uh, starting off with, what was it like growing up in Samantha for you? Um, you know, it, it, living on such a small island, you're limited in certain aspects. But when you go out into the world and you see that, you, when you go to these bigger countries and see how their how youth are raised up, we were very um, fortunate, I look at it as, to be brought up in such a small community where... Uh, it was considered like the islands raising you, not just your parents, you know, especially when we, we were growing up. I don't know how things are different now, but um, our parents knew everyone and everybody knew our parents. So like even when our parents wasn't there, we still had eyes on us, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. So like it, it, it was um, to me, I would say it made me a better person growing up because you 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 had eyes on you all the time so you know you have to conduct yourself a certain way whether you're around your parents or not because either which way the word will get back to your pops or your moms you know what i mean so um it was to me living sometimes it could be pros and cons of growing up on a small island with a small community small culture but um to me it made me the person i am today and to me i am very grateful for being from island Okay. You know, Caribbean roots, Caribbean background, West Indian background. Uh, it's something that we're, it's been envied when I travel. Like, you're, sure. you're from here. Like, you're from this beautiful country. So, I couldn't have it any other way. Yeah. I'm happy to be and proud to be from here. Definitely. So, with that, um, you know, as a youngster, you know, all of us have those that moment where we try to figure out what we want to do. Right. Um, you know, it, some of us know what we wanted from the jump right uh was that the case for you like absolutely what was not. it that sold you <laughs> absolutely not okay if i really tell you what i wanted to be i know you're gonna break out laughing and everybody else who's listening wwf you for real absolutely like, like straight up you used to practice and think i and went to the training bro wow like i that was head on what i wanted to do i want <laughs> i wanted to make a living jumping off the top rope that was <laughs> i know it and were you a sports guy not really <laughs> I mean, I played basketball, school, baseball here and there, but that was my passion, boy. That's all I wanted to do. That's, that was really, like, my mindset. I didn't have anything else planned in life. That's what I wanted to do. 
a wrestler. Yeah. I swear, to, I know it sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but, you know. You, That's the first, I mean, it's the first, but I mean, hey. No, at the end of the day, we all have those childhood dreams. Yeah. Everybody, whether it be a, 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 a wrestler or a firefighter. Or Correct. Police, and then eventually down the line, we choose something else. But that was my go-to. I want It's just a first, you know. that. Yeah. And yeah. I went to the training camp and everything. I know everybody knows it's scripted, it's whatever, but it's just the art of the storytelling behind it. Yes. When I went to the training, you learn how to take the falls, how to take the bumps, how to apply the holes correctly. It is really an art form to it when you really look at it. And I still follow it to this day. I still have a relationship with the wrestling companies and with a lot of the athletes themselves. It's really an art form. There's way more to that business than what we see. Yeah, on what you see. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and, and of course, that, that can be said the same for for what you do right now. Oh, absolutely. You know, there's a lot that um, had to take place in order for you to make it seem so seamless. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's it, it's a lot of years behind it, you know what I mean? Like, a, a lot of tries and errors, a lot of failures here and there, and a lot of criticism on the way up. But if it's something that you really want to do, and I always tell people this, is, is you set your goal, you put your mind to it, and you just focus on that and only that, nothing else matters. It could be done. Yeah. Is if you really want it, it's got to be here. You know? So what was it that sold you... You know, choosing to be a uh, disc jockey, okay, DJ. Okay, so um, not knowingly, I grew up around this. But like, I was so focused on being a wrestler, I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really realize what I had around. Entertainment, nonetheless, basically. My <laughs> dad owned a record store on Front Street in town for years upon years. What was the name of it? And electronics. Mm. It was right across. Excuse me. It was right across the street from C, C Palace, on the Acme Trading Building. Um, my, I grew up around this and I didn't appreciate what was around me. Like, my dad told me stories about how Michael Jackson came in the store as a child when he was part of the Jackson 5, when Barbara Streisand came in the store. Neil Diamond, up to Bob Marley, visited St. Martin, came to my dad's record store. I didn't appreciate that growing up, you know? It's, my mindset was somewhere completely different. And then one day, I remember watching television bump up into BT. I can't remember the name of the program or the name of the DJ. I do know it was a young kid. And the DJ was on there, scratching, mixing, doing tricks. That caught my attention instantly. I was like, yo, I want to get on this. And when, and when, my, when I told my dad I wanted to get, it was like, everything's there. Look, all my equipment's there. Take it. And that's where it all started, right downstairs in my parents' basement with a cassette deck, a portable CD player playing on batteries, one turntable, no mixer, Two home speakers and an amplifier. That's uh, some, how it started. Now, depending on how old you are, some of the stuff you're saying. A lot like, of people do not even know what the hell I'm talking about. A few about. of them. I don't even but know. that's how it all started for me, like the real but, old school way of doing things. Yeah. That's where it all started for Yeah, me. so just as it, um, basically, as, as the way hip-hop was birthed itself. Pretty much. It was, you know, hand-me-down equipment, which I didn't care for. I, you know, I, I was grateful to have what I had. It was a start. Everybody had to start somewhere. Yeah. But the great thing is I had a record disposal like no one had at my age. Yeah, because literally... Because when my dad closed the store, he had records upon records upon records. Mm -hmm. So the music collection I had, I didn't even know what, it, what I had until way later down. And to this day, I still have every single one of those records. Whoa, really? To this day, to this very day. Wow. So, um, uh, with that, well, I'm glad to know that, for example, Irma, or, or nothing has damaged those. Well, devil. that's a different story. Like, I did lose a lot of equipment mm. in Irma. Some of the records did get damaged, but, you know, um, uh, God's Son put them out in the sun, and uh, God's Spirit Life, a lot of them were saved. Okay. And I don't even, like, keep them to use. I keep them out of sentimental value because that's I started sad. those, and it came from my dad's record store. So, a lot of that had a lot of sentimental value to me. Oh, so, um, but even with that, I guess, so basically you had, you, you had no issue in terms of your parents supporting you full-blown, you know? Uh, that's another story. Okay, because I know, you know, again, <laughs> with a lot of cre the creative side, you know, um, oftentimes, you know, parents are not that uh, no, supportive not or, or just maybe hesitant, not that they don't support you per se, but uh, they always look at it like, how are you going to make money from that? Or you need that, to, but you still need a, a, a backup plan. Yes, you need to go to school. my dad's major concern for me because when I told him I wanted to do it, and, and my dad wasn't, he DJed, but he didn't do it on the scale that I wanted to do it on. He more did it 
like when he made his mixed cassettes to sell and did it on radio and stuff like that. So he never did it in actually nightclubs or traveling or anything like that. So when I told him I wanted to do it, he was very skeptical and he was not supportive, especially when I told him I wanted to be known as DJ Outcast. That did not go down well. Wow. And how did you come across with the name? So um, it had a lot creator. to do with the way I grew up. Um, for some strange reason, I always ended up being like the white, only white kid in the class. So I think, I think, you know, the name speaks for itself on that. And not trying to sound racial or any type no, of No, I point. get you. <laughs> it, it, it was difficult times for me growing up, especially being in that situation. But it made me who I am today. It made me tougher. It made me stand up for myself. It made me... Yeah, because uh, you, uh, you were definitely teased yeah, and yeah. harassed oh, and boy. bullied, bullied. Oh, boy. If I have to get into that story, we're going to be here for the rest of the day. But um, it was difficult, but it molded me to become the person I am today and I'm and if I have to do it all over again I wouldn't change anything so it, it, it it made me earn respect earn credibility and for that I'm truly grateful for that okay so from the time where you just you were playing around well I'm saying playing around no, but no, basically it was playing around okay it was, it really was. but I'm um, tinkering with uh, the equipment down in the basement mm -hmm. um how did you progress um what was your your your, your progression like um it was a slow journey because like we didn't have the tools and I tell young DJs this all the time. We didn't have the tools that they have the disposal of today. We didn't have a YouTube. We didn't have the internet that you could go on and say, okay, how do I do this? And you could find a tutorial on that. This was me grabbing myself, putting myself together and going to house parties, sneaking into clubs and all that just so I can get like, an idea so I could just stand on the side and watch the pros do it. And then when I see something that I don't know, I, you know, I try to go home and duplicate what I saw, but then try to do it in my own way with my own style that I'm not trying to copy anyone yeah. per se. So it was a slow process, a slow journey. And I just basically worked my way up from that. And um, I do have to shout out Mixed Master Polly. Mm -hmm. uh, we met each other doing this. In 1999, I entered my first DJ competition in, during the carnival time when it was doing Youth Extravaganza. And I went in as a nobody. Nobody knew who I was. And the reception was not good. I was booed. I had things thrown at me. It was, really? Yeah, it, it's... It was one of so those... So really, a real... So you basically had that on the dog story? Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, Paulie saw something in me and he did take me under his wing and he also oh, he was a senior he was a mentor to me he okay. really mentored me and I'm, i'm very appreciative okay so he had more years oh yeah he's a veteran he was already okay. a veteran before me okay before okay me. okay they didn't know that. he had more years in than me and and he mentored me and 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 he, he he taught me a lot of the business side he didn't particularly teach me things because i already knew what i was doing but he just guided me in the right direction and he, he, he did see something in me that nobody else saw, the drive and the passion to be better and be good at what, the, at what I was doing. And eventually, later down the road, we did, you know, split ways and, you know, we went our separate ways. And um, I tried to establish myself as not part of an organization, but as my own individual. And when it really took a turn uh, for the upside was when I, re when I entered the Heineken Green Synergy in 2004. And I ended up winning the local um, uh, competition, and I was, you know, selected to uh, represent St. Martin on a regional scale in the Grand Caribbean Finals in Antigua, mm -hmm. 2004. I didn't win; I was I placed second, which I'm grateful for. Yeah, so she first shot. At my first shot, I was grateful. Shout out to Ice Kid from St. Vincent who won it that year, and I was grateful for the opportunity. They did wonders for my career. Um, I entered again in 2006, and that took me on a way larger scale because now we had MTV Temple and Temple was covering the grand finals which was in Nassau Bahamas in 2006 I placed second again which is fine it just the fact that I was on that stage yeah. and had that and MTV, had that, TV, the, MTV coverage yes the tension the it connects. did wonders for my career and I'm grateful to, uh, to companies like Heineken and, 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 and MTV Temple for bringing me to that level and um, it, like I said, it did wonders for my career. 
And it, it has just skyrocketed me after that. And then a couple of years later, 2011, when I was featured on BET's 106 in Park as a guest DJ for not one, not two, but three shows. Yeah. Phenomenal. That I remember. Phenomenal. Uh, I, I remember and I was that. only there to do one show. Really? I ended up doing three yeah, shows. Yeah, I, re I remember that. I, I, still in high school then. I, I was like, wow. It was, was breathtaking. Yeah. The, what I do six in Park, most, I mean, it's at like... At that time, it was the... Especially for, for a music for, for yeah. fan. It was the it's highest rated like television show at that time. What freaked me out the most was when they told me, when you look at that camera and the light turns red, just keep in mind that 25 million people are watching you. That shook me. It took me a minute to like, yeah, to, 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 to register that. Well, it's not like an IG or Facebook no, Live. No, like... When TV, when cable, cable TV is, uh, was king still, oh yeah. God. But like after that, just everything just fell into place. And, 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 and I am eternally grateful for all of the opportunities that came my way and, and, and reaching to the level that I'm at today and continuing to be at that level. Because it is getting to the top is one thing, but it's maintaining it is yeah. another. Because it's, it's been a lot of work, I'm sure. It, is, it has been a lot of work. And oh. I'm grateful to say today, last year, May 25 years, I've been doing this professionally. Oh, wow. And I'm nothing but grateful. Nothing but grateful. That I could do what I love, yet still support my family and support myself by doing And that's so. a blessing. And that's a blessing. For sure. Absolutely. For sure. So even um, with what you shared about your, your, your growth period, um, you know, with the local, well, with youth extravaganza, mm -hmm. the local competitions regionally, and then taking off to BET, well, international, basically. Um, what comes to mind is, uh, you know, yourself now as the senior. Um, yeah. have, have you Have you identified uh, um, persons that, you know, you mentor or what's your process like, too? Because I know that sometimes, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, mentorship. While it is, it is useful, you know, having someone to be able to guide you, encourage you, stuff. Um, there are times when it, it, it can turn sour, you know. Yes, um, has that can, happened yeah. to you? But also, what, what's your approach? But you know, um, in in coaching, I guess, I mean, young generation okay, of DJs I've and been stuff. I've asked to mentor before, and I don't necessarily like to say no, but sometimes I have to, in the sense that, excuse me, my schedule is so hectic. It re I'm, and I'm not trying to s say this to, you know, I really am honest with people to say, I want to help you, but technically right now I can't. And I don't want to commit to trying to say I'm going to help you because I don't want to say I'm going to help you. And then I don't have the time to do it. I do offer a lot of advice. Like if a young DJ comes to me and asks me, you know, what would be the steps? What, what can I do? And I would advise them. I would give my honest and most professional opinion as to what would be the proper steps of going forward like what you should do how you should practice and again they have tools i didn't have you have so many tools and channels and people who professionalize in teaching that they could do a 10 times 20 times better job than i can when it comes to teaching because they know the infrastructure they, they have the curriculum to teach someone i i honestly would not know how to teach someone if even if I tried because it is something better shown than it is explained. Yeah, I don't understand. Know if, I, if I'm saying that mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I understand. So like, like right now, my own son wants me to teach him. And I do show him every now and again because I don't want it to I don't want him to be forced saying, you know, my dad's one, I have to become one. No, I want you to yeah, make you, that decision you, on your you own. You want it, yes, correct. And to me, right now, he's too young to say um, this is what I want to do. I'm going to give him time. And if it's something that he definitely wants to pursue, then he has my support 100%. Not sure. showing everything I know. But until that time, I want him to enjoy being a kid. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Focus on school. Enjoy childhood. Because a lot of kids did not get that chance. Yes. Because, that, yeah, that's the next thing too sometimes. Even in, in the case of, in, in, two, in two roles, some, some children just not having the life circumstance to enjoy childhood. Right. But another one where, you know, oftentimes when the parent uh, has filled big shoes, you know, people look at the, the younger one, especially right. if it's a boy. Like, right. Oh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you and I don't want that pressure exactly, exactly, exactly. I really don't. I, yeah. I, like, they're going to look at it like that. That's a kid of outcast. He's got to be able to, like, shell it. Like, I don't want that unfair pressure on him because he don't deserve that. Yeah, he has his own life to live. He has his own life to live. And I want him to choose based on what he wants. For sure. Not, not what I want. Of course, I would love him to fill, um, to continue what I do. But 
And, you know, I don't, I don't expect it from him, and I will never force that upon him. For sure. You know what I mean? So, I mean, if he picks it up, definitely. But until then, um, maybe one day when things quiet down for me and I'm ready to hang the headphones up, per se, I would um, maybe take on a mentorship. Or My dream was once I went to Thailand to do a show, and they brought me to... Um, a DJ school, an actual proper DJ school. And I was absolutely blown away at the at, uh, the entire setup of this. They had three floors, one for, be for beginners, one for intermediate, and one for advanced. And it was the way they had that thing organized, the infrastructure. If I'm going to do teaching, I have to do it on that scale. Yeah, like you I, want it to be the right way. I want right it to be on way. that scale. Yeah. It has to be done the right way. And what I when I saw it there, I was blown away. I said, the day I hang up the headphones for good, this is what I'm going to do. That's what you plan. Yeah, I, a, I I fully understand it because um, you have that much um, level of respect for your craft. Yes, absolutely. I I, I would never want to like, do it halfway or or do it like you know uh, pia pia or the same or people. But Correct. It has to be done properly. And what I saw in Thailand blew my mind. Yeah, it absolutely blew my mind. So one of the key things is, of course, the equipment and setup was different um, and has changed a lot. Oh, yeah, over um, the years, definitely. So what sort of tools would you say are probably, you know, those things that are essential to, to what you do today? Well, remember, I came up in the era of records. I came up in the era of records, and then eventually we evolved over to CDs, and then from CDs it came over to the laptop area. And thank God for the laptop area, <laughs> because carrying those crates and CD bags, it was not cute. So when we evolved over to the laptop area, it, it was both a good and a bad thing because it made our life easier for those who've been doing it for so many years. But then here comes the era of everybody now can be a DJ. Anybody can pick up a laptop, download the software, get a few songs off of YouTube, and bam, they're a DJ. And it kind of, uh, I don't want to say killed our business, but it came to a point where why am I paying you this when I could pay this kid this? Yeah. <laughs> You know, it, it, it kind of messed up the business in some sort of a ways, but then it started to show quality over quantity. Like, okay, you could pay this kid this, but will you get the quality if you're paying for this? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it started to open people's eyes a lot more on the respect and um, culture and craft of the business. So, it, in a way, it was a good and a bad thing, but to answer your question, yes, the equipment has evolved dramatically over the years compared to what we did and the amount of heavy equipment we used to have to use. Dude, at one point, we used to have to walk with like six to ten guys just to go set up our little house party with the amount of things you have to walk with, the amount of, you have to get somebody with a truck. That, those days are over. <laughs> like, I could put everything in the trunk of my car now and, and pull up and do a house and party easy, mm -hmm. which is great, which is great. Thank goodness. But it, 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 it's evolved in both good ways, bad ways, you know, your pros and your cons. And um, I do have find for sure that it has evolved for the best, for the better. Uh, but it's just based on how you look at things and how you approach things. Yeah, I understand. And <clears throat> I'm glad that you said that because first thing that comes to mind for me is building a brand. And Which is very important. Yes, and I'm curious about... You know, lessons you've learned uh, about branding and what oh, what steps did you uh, take to brand yourself that, you know, when people hear DJ Outcast that they right. expect, a, they have this great expectancy. Right. Um, I learned that through traveling. Like when I've done tours of the U.S., tours of Canada, especially in Europe. Europe is where I learned most of it. Because you have to remember, when you go to these huge countries, you have, w you have thousands of DJs. It's not just you. You're dealing with thousands of DJs. Some maybe not on your level, but then some would blow you completely out of the water. It, and it's amazing to watch. And I love traveling for that because you get to play for different audiences and you get to experience different cultures, the, the way they react to certain types of music. And sometimes you could just be yourself or sometimes it forces you to come out of your comfort zone, you know, the way you, you, know, you would particularly play. So you learn that on, over the years on the road. Um, when it comes to branding now, is when I really learned when I travel is how to present yourself and it everything is about image and the way you're presented when you're meeting a new client or you're networking uh, if your logo is properly done if you have a proper business card if you're you, you just can't show up somewhere dressed in socks and slippers you have to be presentable and, and it, it's so much to it that I never saw before until I started moving around and then 
when I saw how it was professionally done and how it's supposed to and the certain expectations and standards that you have to meet to, mm -hmm. if you have a professional photo shoot, like if somebody asks you, like, can you send me pictures and logos for me to put on my artwork that you send professional photos, like, wow, look at this. Yeah. This is somebody dealing, I'm dealing with a professional here. The right headshots and stuff. All of that with your logo properly done. When someone's booking you and you have, um, when you issue a contract, um, how the contract is written out, if it's properly represented, or even in my case, I have uh, international ma uh, management that manages me. Um, whenever I travel, they'd go to the, the, the client would go through my management and my management, you know, I'm properly represented. So a lot of that has to do with the branding as well. How you're represented on social media, how you're represented on, on YouTube, on Instagram and stuff like that. It is so important, especially over the years now how we have evolved, especially on the internet age with, 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 with the importance. And I keep stressing on this, the importance of social media. It, 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 you don't look at it much of as a branding tool, but you really get to appreciate and, and know how important it really is, how key and crucial it really is. And over the years, you, you, you make sure you, you, your brand is well represented or you have somebody representing your brand to the best of their ability. And you get to really find out how critical and crucial it is. And I'm, I'm grateful that I'm, I'm, prep, I'm pretty much pretty well represented. But I also, when I when you to, to reiterate, reiterate what you um, stressed on earlier, what I would offer advice to younger people is to get that stuff in order as soon as possible. Yep. Because um, you may start as an amateur now, but the more uh, you focus on getting that together now, and then when your brand eventually grows, at least you have everything in place already. Like, uh, there's still certain things that I'm working on, especially like content online and all of that stuff because my schedule's being so tight. But I try to put together as much time as I can to focus on that because when someone, when my management is booking me, the first thing they ask, oh, we need this. Do you have this? Do you have anything for him for this? What's his latest mix? Uh, do you have anything on YouTube that we could look at? You have to make sure you have these things together for when it's asked that you ha are able to present it. Yes, it makes, it makes so much sense. And, um, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll definitely have you share on is even as it relates to um, developing relationships that you are able to get management and, 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 and oh, uh, yeah. things to look out for. Uh, but we get into that right after the break. So um, stay tuned and we'll be right back. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the news behind the news with Ralph Kintav on Mix 94.7 FM. And this afternoon, I'm joined with uh, the cut creator DJ Outcast as we talk about the world of entertainment from a, a DJ perspective, of course. And one of the key things that you see a lot of discussions on, especially in the hip hop world, is that it relates to record deals, management, and so forth. Yeah. Um, there are many persons who have horror stories, you know, of, oh, of having... I've heard some myself. Of, you know, um, when it comes to bad management contracts and, and deals. So uh, what was your experience like in terms of um, the, the, the key things that you, re you recognize the need to, to look out for, but, but also have established yeah. when you, you know, create that relationship where, you know, um, you, know you, you recognize the need for, for a manager right. to help you broaden your... Mm -hmm. in, yeah, increase your brand. Yes. Um, get get gigs that probably on your own you wouldn't be able to get mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, well, I started like like I um, mentioned before when I was doing the Heineken um, stuff like that. Uh, that's the first time I really had proper representation, <clears throat> and it went it went very well. It it started good, and um, you know eventually I kind of like outgrew that. And we parted ways, but peacefully. I didn't want to uh, break relationships or break networks with anybody. And we parted peacefully, and we're still friends to this day. Um, eventually, my dad took over my management at one mm. point because um, he, he, he felt the best person to represent me would be somebody who has my best interests in mind, which I understand his point of view. And we did that for a little while. Um, dad did his best, but it was a little over his head, per se. And eventually, I did meet the person who is managing me now, and we're somewhat business partners. Um, I'm signed under Caribbean Entertainment with uh, my manager, Brad Hemmings, and we have a mutual understanding. Not, o not only does he manage me, but we work together as um, uh, artist bookings. We do, we do uh, events and all that. We, we bring artists in, perform here in St. Martin before, and we book artists all over the world. So we've been doing that together as well. Gotcha. So it's kind of like... Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, co-partnership. So he manages me full time and I help open that business as well. And that is also a great business to get into. I learned so much working with him uh, to that other aspect of the entertainment business. And he's actually given me assignments, working with artists. I've actually traveled with artists already as their road manager has been before in the past. And it's taught me so much about the other aspect of the music business, which I'm grateful for, for that experience. And that is eventually something besides like the DJ school that I would like to do. Eventually when I do hang up the headphones, this is what I would do full time after DJing would be um, uh, not, not per se artist management, but more artists, booking artists, uh, relations. Uh, so. Like okay. being on the road as a, a road manager or um, as an artist representative in that per, in that aspect, if you know. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, it's a great. It's a good. It's a different aspect of the business, and you learn so much from it. And I, I understand because you actually answered a, a, one of the questions I have for you much later on. All good. Which is all good for sure. Um, because I'm curious, you know, as well. Because I was curious, basically, that you know. Um, I don't know if you'll be DJing forever, you know. So what I some, know, I won't be DJing so, forever. So, so what are uh, you know um, the ways in which you're looking to pivot? Yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, I'm going to do this for as long as the good Lord blesses me for, for it, sure. or until I just can't hear anything anymore because <laughs> I'm on the verge of that anyway. But for as long as the good Lord blesses me that I can be able to do this, I will do it for as long as for I sure. can. Really good. But then also the same front with the contracting, uh, I'm cur- well, management. I'm curious about mm-hmm. what are, like the key things you got to look out for. Um, or, if that person or to has, expect. yeah, if that, first of all, when you're, when you're looking for a manager, you have to look for somebody who has your best interest in mind, not their own. You know what I'm saying? It, it, and that could be a little tricky to do at the beginning. Yeah. But, um, th- when my management deal was different because that kind of like, kind of fell into my lap unexpectedly because I wasn't uh. looking for it. But, um, what I would offer to someone Whatever advice I would I could offer to someone is when you're looking for a manager to do your research on that person before signing anything. Do your research on this person. Is this person reliable? Who have they worked with before? What have they done for that person before that? Um, when it's time to start negotiating, what are their percentages? What are their rates? What are they looking? What are they expecting from you? What are you expecting from them? Make sure to have all of that clarified from before before signing anything. I know this sounds like you know maybe preposterous for a couple of other people but before you sign anything read that contract because you do and even if you do not understand what you're reading get someone who understands it to explain it don't be afraid to say i don't know don't be afraid to say you don't know because there's going to be a lot of big words in there you might not understand get someone who understands it to explain it to you to understand what you are signing i i say this countless times not only the djs or artists i'm talking about like people who are doing like main like mainstream record deals or or publishing deals or distribution deals like that read what you're signing because sometimes that contract cannot be in your best interest it could be the person who you're signing is for his best interest yeah now you basically end up working for them you're basically working to them or, or signing your soul away per se. I'm I, I'm not I, I'm not even trying to sugarcoat this for all your listeners right now. I'm really trying to be as blunt and as honest as I possibly can. Read before you sign. Hmm. That's the only advice I could possibly give you is before signing anything. Read before you sign because that's a mistake I've made in the past before. Yeah, I can imagine. And one of the things uh, when I think about DJing is uh, is is in particular, for example, crowd control. Yes. Um, I'm curious about as well, even with your start, but uh, your your journey. Um, what was it like? Did, well, did, one, did you ever have stage fright? But also, consider the fact that you have traveled all over the world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how have you, uh, I guess, trained yourself to be able to, you know, um, it's a good question. people, no, no it's matter a good where question. you are, big or small, yeah, formal or informal, etc. Um, to answer that question about stage fright. Especially being someone who not only DJs but MCs for myself at the same time, that took a lot. And people ask me all the time, like, how do you train yourself to do that? It's very simple. I know it sounds like childish or sounds jokey. The but mirror, mirror. I have a, okay. Mirror. Yeah. A brush in hand, pretend it's a mic, stand in front of that mirror, and make sure you feel confident and comfortable with yourself and how you. Look, you got to look at that mirror and see, 
that this person now is ready to step in front of a stage. You have to feel confident enough hmm. in yourself that, okay, I think I'm ready to do this now. Okay. And there was a lot of countless nights I did that. I would put the whole DJ set up in front of the mirror and do that. that that's how I kind of trained myself to do that. Um, traveling now to different countries, and especially, especially if it's the first time you're visiting that country, you don't know what to expect. You don't know um, what you're playing for, what they like, what they don't like. Um, I try to do as much homework as I can, especially when I'm visiting a country for the first time. Uh, I try to reach out to maybe a radio personality or a local DJ, like, listen, I'm coming into your city. <clears throat> some of them respond, some of them don't. Um, but I need to know well, what they like, you, you what made they don't. I try, I try to make contact yeah. and um, try to do as much homework as I possibly can. Yes. And then when I do step on stage, I always try to keep this in mind. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to go up there and play like their DJs. They brought me in here for a reason. They brought me here to be me. So yes, I'm going to go up authentic. there and be me as much as possible. Yes, I will try to incorporate some of their style at the same time, but I'm trying to be me because that's the reason they brought me there is to be myself. And I try to bring myself and my culture, my St. Martin culture, a lot to these different countries. And they appreciate it. For sure. They appreciate it. Yeah, because authenticity stands out. Absolutely. You know? I, I went to... The reason there's a copy is because there's yeah, the original. I went to Australia once. I did a tour of Australia. And then nice. off the coast of Australia is another island called New Caledonia. Yes. I went to New yeah. Caledonia. I was so upset when I saw on the flyer DJ Ocasio from New York. I'm not from New York, bro. And I specifically said that before I even started my show. Forget what y'all read. I am not from New York City. I'm from a little 37 square mile island in the Caribbean called St. Martin. And you know what's the crazy part? Six months down the road, I met people from New Caledonia that came here on vacation based on me being in their country. Wow. Same thing happened to me when I was in Hong Kong. I traveled to Hong Kong for Chinese New Year. They had no idea what or who, where or whatever St. Martin was. And because I presented myself so strong, I met a couple who are into um, like the Asian Hollywood. Yes, like they do. Yeah. They do Chinese movies and stuff. Yes, one guy's American. He's married to an an Asian model. I met this couple in VIP. They were at the party I played. They visited St. Martin on vacation. A big social media following that they had, and it was publicized in St. Martin the entire time they was here. That makes me proud to know that I can carry St. Martin on my back, be somewhat of an ambassador to our country. That's right. And make people from these other countries realize what St. Martin is and what we have to offer. That's right. That's right. And, so, and it's a beautiful thing because um, <clears throat> with that, uh, even, I guess, on the flip side of that question is what has being on stage taught you about people? That they're open to different experiences. They're not just there to um, hear one type of thing or to experience one type of thing. Especially if you're doing a big stage, like a festival or something. Like clubs is one thing. Being on stage at a festival with thousands of people is a completely different thing. And I thrive off of that. I love being on those festival stages. I prefer the festival stage over a club any day. Hmm. Because you get, to, you get to try different things. You get to do different things. You get to actually not just stand there and DJ, but you get to give an actual show. You get to, and you get to become somewhat of an artist yourself. That's and true. I love that. Yeah, I, I thrive off. And of I think the the one DJ mm -hmm. who, of course, has mastered that is the DJ Khaled. Khaled, uh, I'm actually very good friends with Khaled for years. Uh, I met him years ago. I played in a club in Miami called Madhouse. It was no, it could it could hold no more than 150 to 200 people. That's where Khaled got his start. I remember meeting him years ago. My my sister currently lives in Miami for years. And um, I remember meeting him. He was at the time he was working on Hot 99 Jams in Miami. And we always kept a good relationship. And his growth, not only as a DJ, but an artist of his caliber is amazing. It's an amazing success story when you look at it. And um, I haven't spoken to him some time. Like we speak very briefly on and off. But what I love about him the most is how humble he stayed through all of his success. And he took... The art of DJing and made it mainstream and he became more of an artist I mean more of a DJ he became an actual artist mm -hmm. and I completely admire that about him like to, 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 to know where he started to where he is at now it's an amazing success story 
Yeah. And I, I look to him as uh, I look to him a lot as an inspiration to DJs all over. Yeah. To know that he came from where he's at to where he's at now, it's an amazing story. So I'm curious as well as um, at present, you know, who are those DJs that you look up to, but also, you know, um, kind of pushes you to, to go a step further. For like, you know, when I think of, of DJs, well, I think of one DJ in particular, because Nas is my favorite um, rapper. Right. Uh, Prem. Uh, Premier. Yeah, exactly. You a know? legend in the game. Legend, absolute legend in the game. He's he's definitely one of them. But if you have to ask me, my top inspiration would be DJ Jazzy Jeff. Yeah, that Jeff, Jeff is a monster. Oh my goodness, he's amazing to watch live. Jazzy Jeff, there's another one. He he, he actually is the one that inspired me to start using a mic while I'm DJing. That's Kid Capri. Uh -huh. Kid Capri is an absolute monster in on on the mic while DJing. Kid Capri, Jazzy Jeff. Um, I have to shout, of course, shout out some of our local um, legends as well. Guys like Wilson, uh, Mixed Master Polly, DJ Chef, Dave Nice, uh, Rest in Peace, DJ Menace. These were all guys I looked up to as my heroes growing up. And um, they were all inspirations to me. But if we're talking on a mainstream, like international level, number one on that list would be Jazzy Jeff. Absolutely Jazzy Jeff. Okay. He's, and I've had the absolute honor of, of working with him on two separate occasions. Very nice guy and super talented. I hope one day I could even come near his legendary status. One day, hopefully. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, you're not too far off. <laughs> I, I hope so. I mean, I'm trying my best. But So uh, one of the things that come to mind as well <laughs> is, uh, you know, as, you, as we spoke a little earlier about pivoting, mm -hmm. is the fact that, you know, um, we went through well one you share that for example irma damaged your equipment yeah but i'm curious about what was in your mind during the lockdown and through the pandemic and how did it shift your mindset in terms of adapting to the change that it brought across with the, the change that is to come it was a, it was a learning experience it was a hard learning experience because you know you you don't plan for something like that yeah you, you, the, everybody was completely caught off guard with that nobody saw that coming we had no warning at least with a hurricane we actually know what's ahead of us we had no idea that was coming our way and um it really puts everyone in survival mode like it it it, it brought in to say okay how are we going to get past this it definitely taught me um to have some sort of a backup plan because you know when you when you have when you're in the entertainment field and out entertainment gets shut down, you're basically shut down with it. There's really not much for you to do, and we had to literally adapt and try to find other ways and means of um, entertaining people with with entertainment being on complete lockdown. Which is why I turned to how important, how stressing, how important social media is. That's when we turned to online and brought the party online and brought the party to actually to people's homes. And I feel in, in somewhat of a way that I actually helped a lot of people get through those hard times. Yeah. So I, I, so I was told that was, a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. So like when I had when honestly, the first I'll tell you this, right. I had absolutely no intention of doing it. And I'll explain to you why. I remember being home. Um, I kind of appreciated the, the, the downtime as well because I got to spend a lot of time with my family and yeah, my kids. And, and I appreciate it for that because I'm on the road a lot. I move around a lot. A lot of times when they want to play, I'm dog tired i can barely lift my arm much less play with them and i got a lot of time that i lost with them during that time so maybe it was a blessing in disguise somewhat to an extent i had absolutely no intention of doing that because from the minute you open your phone every single dj that i follow was live everybody was doing it <laughs> and i didn't, just didn't want to you know follow the crowd be part of the soup right i didn't want to do it i understand so my manager who i elaborated on earlier brad God bless Brad. Brad calls me and is like, why are you not doing this? And I explained to him, I'm like, I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. He said, but yeah, but Outcast is not doing it. Outcast, somebody's not doing it the way you would do it. Or mm. they're not, your followers are probably looking to you and you're not doing it. And you're kind of letting them down. And when he, when he broke it down to me, I was like, damn, okay, I have to do something now. And literally, with no promotion, with no planning, in a matter of maybe two to three hours notice, we put something out like, to hell with it, tonight we're gonna be live from such a time to such a time. And the response was enormous. 
So I decided to hell with it. As long as we're going to be locked up in my house, let's do this every weekend. And eventually, um, sponsors got involved. Like, yo, I, we see what you're doing. We want to be a part of this. And that's actually how yeah. I was getting by the lockdown. The pandemic part. Yeah. Is, yeah. <laughs> I really got by doing that. And, um, like, again, it was not planned. Yes. It was not well thought out to begin with but after we saw the and you had no intention one, of we doing had it. no intention of doing it yes and to see how it, it just exploded in one night and to see how far that it went i mean it ran its course it, it you know it, you couldn't do that forever Correct. eventually things opened back up and you know it, the, the views went down and people lost interest because people started to move around again but for that little time that we had where everybody was locked up home, home couldn't do anything yes it was a great experience. I enjoyed doing it. I really did because you get to interact with people differently. And uh, I was, again, I was told how many people I helped get through it because it affected everybody differently. It affected everybody like physically, especially mentally. Mentally, especially. Especially mentally. Like people didn't know what they were going to do. A lot of people didn't know how they was going to get by the month. Like it, it, people were in a bad place. And to know that I could give them a few hours of somewhat of a relief, of somewhat of a, a release, God is good. I keep saying that. God For is sure. good. Really, truly. So, you know, one of the things that, I mean, with all your experience, you know, you're still very much home-based. Um, you yeah. have your radio program. You perform. Well, you yeah, perform. And um, you also play at uh, different uh, events and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so, considering... You know, 25 years in the game. Uh, one, what is your thoughts on the present state of St. Martin's entertainment industry? And what can we do to take it further? Especially as it relates to, you know, going, looking at what you kind of want to do in the future. Right. Artist development. Right. Road promo, etc. Because, you know, I, I often think that we have the talent. Um, we have beyond the talent. Yes. But then it's, you know, uh, there are more who can really make it. As just as we celebrate uh, regional international artists coming right. here, we have the talents that can be that for other places too. Absolutely. So I'm curious on your take on that. Um, okay, what can we do? Like, okay, nightlife definitely took a hit after Irma and after COVID. Uh, we have ways to go before we can get back to where we were prior to that. But we're off to a great start. And uh, if we continue on the momentum that we are now, I think we're... Um, we're well on our way to being back to where we were, if not better. Um, in the sense of our artists becoming on that major grand scale that you spoke of, I don't think it really has anything to do with what we're doing. I think they just have to change their mentality. Okay. In the sense of, um, I've spoke about this online before. I've been criticized about it, but that's just my opinion. Everybody has an opinion. <clears throat> but I'm talking like traveling myself and dealing with these artists on a daily basis. It has to be up here. It, it really has to be a mental thing that, okay, I've done what I can what I can do here locally. I've reached a certain level and I need to take it further. And they have to have that mindset to now not only start thinking internationally, but start making music with an international mindset. Sound, yeah. Like what you might find appealing to a local audience might not be appealing to an international audience. If you understand what I'm yes. trying to say. Like what we consider sounding great might not be um, considered anything at all by an international audience. Even as uh, regional as the Caribbean, and we're not even talking about the United States or Europe or anything like yes, that. Yes. So I think it has to be a mindset, which some of them do have, but I think we need more of our artists to have that mindset. Like I need to prioritize my stuff outward. Once I have that local fan base and that local um, growth that I reach, okay, I've, I've done this here, it's time time to evolve and move Branch on. Off. And once, once they have that mindset properly, I think everybody could do better, be beneficial from that. Okay, gotcha. Yes, uh, I'm glad you shared that then because uh, in addition to that, uh, I think about what you explain earlier really about management too yeah. and that you know that has the a lot to do with it as well, as well. Yeah. yeah because you, you have to you need that network definitely you know to, to help take you further as mm -hmm. well and you have to and, and like especially like I was mentioning before do your research on that manager and also that manager has to know 
certain people in true, this industry. True. What I've learned is you could be as talented as you, you could be God sent talented, but it's not even it, especially now, maybe before it used to be different, but now it's not about how talented you are and it's not about what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. Really and truly, I, I, I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. That is just how it is. Because okay. I've seen from very non-talented people, and I'm being as frank as possible, not only just here in St. Martin, but especially internationally, very untalented people become millionaires, not based on what they do, but because of who they know. And who knows them. So <laughs> if you do choose a manager, mm -hmm. at least let it be someone well who knows people, who's well-connected and well-networked that can get you to these places. Yes, definitely. Now, I'm not encouraging untalented people to pursue that. Get your, get your stuff together. Make sure your talent is to the right, my, that right place that you think, okay, I can move on now. But just make sure when you're selecting someone to represent you that they know what they're doing, they're well-connected and can get you to these places. <laughs> if you're on a sound. Yes. So, um, I think finally... One of the things that you also do, and you, you, you talked about it just a bit, is you travel a lot. Yes. Uh, how, um, you know, considering that, you know, again, this is a, a career choice that you wanted to make, um, that, that you made from young. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, you also have a family. Yes. Uh, how is it balancing that too? Because um, um, I know probably that may be a deterrent for some folks. Like, just, yes. Don't know if, if they will be able to maintain. I am very blessed to be able to travel to all these places that I've been to but still be home-based. And I'll explain to you why. Um, I did have plans and intentions of possibly not, you know, being home-based here to move on and, you know, try to relocate to a place where, you know, uh, your structure would be different. But I was, I was told straight up, do not move from where you are. And for several reasons, I'm like, he had to really explain that to me, like, why? Why am I staying here? It's like, bro, you are easy sell from where you are right now. I'm like, why? It's like, if you come to New York, if you go to Miami, oh, I'm, we're bringing in DJ Outcast from Miami. Like, to the United States, that's like every other DJ. I am flying you from an exotic location in the Caribbean. You're an entity from the Caribbean. I am flying in the best DJ from the Caribbean. That's an easy sell. Yeah, I see what you're saying. That's an easy sell. Like, I'm bringing you from this exotic location in the Caribbean to play in Miami, to play in Atlanta, to play in New York, to play in LA. He said, that's an easy sell, especially in Europe, in Asia. They're like, oh my gosh, this guy coming from the islands. Some people look at it that way. Some people look at it, oh, they're coming from this backward country. <laughs> but yeah. majority of it, it's like, wow, they're coming from I this I think the main location. thing is that you got the international label. Absolutely. You get yeah. that international label. So I get to do what I love, hmm. still be around my family. And to be honest with you, if I had take my parents or my wife's parents, only grandkids, away from them, that would have been more disastrous than anything else. So I get that comfort of being home, being around my family, being around my parents, my wife being around her parents, and my grandkids could grow up on an island where I grew up. I mean, my, my kids. Yeah, yes, correct. And they are when we one day become a grandparent here. That's ideal. That's absolutely ideal for me that I can experience that still yet travel the world because St. Martin Airport, we're blessed that we could catch a flight and travel to anywhere. Almost anywhere, basically. Pretty much. We could go anywhere from here. Once we could get to either Miami, New York, we can go anywhere. Yes. And for the 25 years that I've been doing this, uh, Mr. Kantav, I am blessed and overwhelmed at times to know where music has taken me. Because if you had asked me 20 years ago, do you know that you will be here and there and you're going to be doing music because of that? Like, I would have never believed you. The good Lord has blessed me to do tours of the United States, of Canada, throughout the Caribbean. Um, parts of Europe, I've, you only see in magazines and on television. I have done festivals in Japan as far as Hong Kong. I've done Beijing, Australia, uh, parts of China, Poland. Uh, Nothing in Africa yet? I was offered. I was offered to do um, Africa. The show did not happen, and my wife was terrified for me to go, which I, you know. Um, 
But I would, would have loved to have done it, especially now with the growth of Afro Afrobeats. Afrobeats, yeah, that's um, exactly what's I would have yeah. loved to have up, done the opportunity. I'm sure the opportunity will come across. But I guess, yeah, because Afrobeats is still growing, so... Yeah. Yeah. Um, but p- parts of South America, <clears throat> um, Suriname, Colombia, Panama, uh, the, Mexico, parts I've never dreamed of. Sometimes I even have to go to these countries and ask, how do you know who I am? And the internet has made the world so small. Yes. That's amazing. And I'm so grateful and, et- and eternally like flabbergasted sometimes. Like, wow, did this country really send for me? Like, how they know who I am? But especially now with, with, with YouTube and all that, and everybody is so wow and amazed by our airport. That's really our selling point. Some people might not be convinced of that, but you see when them planes be landing over the beach, that is really our selling point. People fly from all over the world to see that live. So being able to fly all across the world to represent St. Martin is an absolute blessing for me, and I'm nothing but grateful for that. Great. Well, hello, Cass. We'd like to thank you so much for coming on the program. and uh, Absolutely. Thank you for having me into um, you know into the entertainment and, and show business and to our listeners and viewers thank you guys so much as well for joining us on today's program and be sure to tune in again tomorrow take care <laughs>